Red Winter is a new game by GMT. It depicts a battle that took place in 1939 between Finns and Soviets uh, during the Winter War. Not a subject that has been gamed in a million war games, but an interesting one. This is a battle where a lot of interesting factors were at play. Uh, for example, terrain and weather uh, presented the opponents with particularly tough challenges, especially for the Soviets that were not as well equipped as the Finns. Uh, then you have different composition of troops, only the Soviets have the advantage of having armor, so the type of heavy attack, but on the other hand also armor is restricted to uh, the road net and the Finns have the advantage of extra mobility thanks to their ski infantry. Then you have different styles of fighting from a direct attack uh, from uh, the Soviets to uh, the response from the Finns with a more of a, of a guerrilla style of fighting. So just many different things that really uh, were part of this battle that played a role in it. And I have to say this is a design that while remaining playable does attempt to convey all this. So let me show you how the design does this. I don't think I'll be able to cover all these things but I want to give you a general sense of of, of the main concepts of the game. This is the map for the game. It is printed on paper. Here I placed it on a magnetic board and I'm using magnetic counter holders to keep my counters organized and where they're supposed to be. This is the setup for the uh, campaign game with only two stacks of Soviet units that are entering the board from that uh, area there. You have two stacks of Finn units here and other Finn units here. These units do not start the, the game exactly as you see them. They simply have to be placed within four hexes from that hex there. The hex in the middle of that configuration that I have uh, created there. Just to give you an idea of where these units can be placed at the beginning and you can experiment with the exact location in which these units will go. Then of course you have more units that will enter the game in later turns and I placed uh, those units on the turn track and well you can see again the advantage of magnetic counter holders. You can uh, prepare the turn track like this and then not worry about moving the turn track around. Things are still uh, organized and where they're supposed to be. Um, and this is the turn track with the reinforcement schedule for the campaign game. So as you can see there are really many units that will enter the game especially for the Soviet player. The map represents the area of the conflict and terrain here has some very interesting uh, aspects. Uh, the first of which is that um, the map allows you to move very fast or very slowly. It is hard for most units to find a way of kind of sort of just moving uh, by spending one movement X per point. Uh, the areas that you see here, the white areas are frozen lake. Uh, Finn units can move through those hexes here, through these hexes, by spending a movement point, yes, but the Soviet units, which are the numerical majority on the, of units on the board, spend 1.5 movement points. Roads, uh, primary roads and secondary roads, cost 0.5 movement points uh, for most units to move through but as soon as you leave the roads or you leave the village, village is also one movement point, uh, then it is very hard to move because forests, these axes here, they cost two movement points each and then you have these axes here, this is wetland and wetland costs three movement points to move through. Uh, for, for, for a unit. And also you have vehicles such as armor that are restricted to the roads only. So when you're moving on the roads you're moving very fast but as soon as you leave the road then you start moving extremely slowly and that means that of course uh, one of the two sides can try to block some key points of the road net to considerably slow down the opponent. Also, all units project a zone of control in the six hexes surrounding them and enemy units that enter a zone of control of the opponent have to end the movement immediately and the following turn if they move out of the zone of control they have to spend an extra movement point to do so. Day turns, and that means most turns, 
are divided first in an action phase for the uh, first player, that action phase is followed by the combat phase for that player, then the opponent goes to the same phases, action and combat, and then the turn is over. Knight turns work in a slightly different way, and there are extra procedures that need to be completed and extra options for the players. But let's talk about day turns for now. During the action phase, your units can do one of three things. Uh, reduced infantry units can attempt to recover, so infantry units that are on their reduced side and, do, and don't do anything else during their action phase uh, can roll a die, you apply modifiers, and if you roll a modified six or more, the unit is brought back to its full side, and that is recovered, or so to say, attempt to recover. Uh, a unit can dig in. When a unit is digging in, you place a digging in marker on that unit. If the unit performs the same action again in the following turn, then that marker is flipped to its dug in side, which offers a shift of one column to the advantage of the defender on the combat results table when that unit is targeted by the opponent. So basically it takes two turns to be able to uh, be dug in to receive that bonus. Or, of course, units can simply move during their action phase. Units can move up to their movement allowance, which is the number at the bottom right corner of the counters. Movement will be modified by terrain and presence of enemy zones of control. During movement, you can also execute assaults if you have enough movement points. If you can pay the movement point penalty to launch an assault, then you can attack the opponent during the movement phase using an assault. Assaults are resolved more or less like normal combats. They just use a different set of modifiers and you cannot use ranged fire support. I'll explain in a minute what that is. After the action phase, you have the combat phase, which usually will be between adjacent units. Units of the active player can attack units that are adjacent to his units. Units that are able to launch uh, range attacks can use those attacks to uh, attack independently, or they can use it that attack to support uh, close combat. And actually this is one of the most interesting things in this design to me, the, uh, the options that are given to you by uh, range fire support. What does it mean? It means that uh, combat is resolved in a somewhat traditional way overall. You compute the combat odds between the combat factor of the defender and that of the attacker, you find the appropriate column, you apply modifiers, uh, shifts that you may receive from several circumstances on the board, you roll two dice and you cross-reference the result. And the result will be a number of hits that is inflicted on the attacker uh, left of the slash and or the defender. Those hits can be taken as step losses or as retreats and I like the option that you're given here that is that you can choose to hold ground and take more damage or simply to retreat but of course you are uh, losing your position. The attacker always must take the first hit as a step loss. The fact that um, the hit number for the attacker is printed in red is a reminder of that. But now, the cool thing here is that before you resolve close combat proper, that is, you roll on the table that I just showed you, you can use uh, range fire support. So your units that are able to fire on the units of the opponent that are involved in close combat can use their uh, range fire attack to support the close combat. Units have two types of combat strength. One is the close combat strength, the number on the left. If the number is in a black box, the number is doubled during uh, during combat, if the unit is defending. And then they have range attack, which is the number in the middle, three, four here. And it is associated with a smaller number, which is the range. Suppose that this is the case, the Soviets are attacking here, then this unit, and even this unit here, can lend support to this unit by attacking this unit with range attacks. When you resolve a range attack, you roll on a table, you apply modifiers, and maybe nothing will happen. 
or you will inflict um, damage on the opponent and or you may be able to inflict levels of suppression. For each suppression result that you have, you place a suppress marker by the target, up to three can be in play. And if the defender also has range fire support and uses that support and is successful in doing so, then also the defender gets to add levels of suppression, which of course will cancel out that of the, those of the opponent. At the end, when all range fire support is resolved, you apply the modifiers here, uh, which will be column shifts in the advantage of the defender or the attacker, depending on uh, the side that is landing support. So actually you are uh, using range support to inflict damage on the opponent, but also to give your close combat units advantages on the combat results table. During night turns, so units can move and even attack. Actually, if a unit does not start the enemy zone of control, can move up to twice its movement allowance during a night turn. Not to suggest that units move faster at night, but simply night turns represent much longer periods of time than uh, day turns do. During night turns also, the Soviets may build the bonfire to protect themselves against, uh, against the, the very cold night. Um, and Finn units have the opportunity of launching a special type of attack called Night Raid. They can attack Soviet units and then come back to their original position before morning. So basically you do not move the Finn units that you're using to launch the Night Raid. The movement back and forth is simply abstracted. Only full strength infantry companies can be used for this type of attack. When you decide to use your units for a night raid, you roll on a special table to see whether units get lost on the way there or not. If they do not get lost on their way to the target, then you launch your attack, your night raid, and you usually have a mod and modifier bonus for the, for the surprise attack. On top of that, if the Finns are launching a night raid against units protected by a bonfire, the Finns get a staggering two columns bonus uh, shift on the combat table because of that, because they are attacking a target which is particularly exposed because of the bonfire. Uh, so the Soviets have a little bit of a dilemma here. They may choose to protect themselves against the cold, but then they can become easy target for nitrates, or they can choose not to use a bonfire, but then uh, the cold weather of the night may inflict damage. In fact, at the end of the night turns, you have to roll for sub-zero losses for Soviet units that are not under a bonfire marker, and for thin units that engaged in any type of combat during the turn. For the test, you will die, apply modifier, and that will tell you whether the stack that you are testing will lose a step or not. You lose a step per stack, not per unit. Still, of course, it is a damage that then you have to deal with. Nice. This is a nice game. This is a game that I enjoy. I enjoy the fact that the game presents you with uh, many different options and decisions uh, at every step of the way, including when it is not your turn. Then you still have to make decisions about uh, how and when and where to assign uh, defensive range support. You still have to decide how to take your uh, your hits as step losses or retreats. There's still decisions that you have to make there. And this is just a game that has a lot of interesting elements that have been added around a core of overall pretty familiar, well-known concepts in war gaming, from zone control to certain rules about movement, uh, the combat odds. So you have that interesting balance between it. A game that is not too hard to learn because of what you can expect from that game to be there, and a game that is fun to play and exciting because it also is offering you something new, something innovative. So I definitely like that. And I like how these new concepts really add chrome uh, to the experience, but without feeling 
uh, gratuitous without feeling uh, historical de like historical details that have been added for the sake of it. They represent historical chrome and they also uh, create challenges, give you options, um, give you decisions to make and of course that means that they also enrich gameplay. So this is a game that I really enjoyed. It also comes with a very rich playbook with tons of historical information, uh, with a lot of scenarios to play, very different scenarios from a long campaign game that will take Take you uh, several evenings to complete, to much shorter scenarios, uh, historical scenarios, alternate history scenarios, a lot of different ways of playing on the map. The map does work in very different ways depending on the areas in which the action is taking place, which of course is great, as to the variety of the experience. So this is just a very, very good game, a game that clearly is a labor of love. You can see how much uh, thought and love and play testing has been put into this design, and as a result, this is to me a very solid design. One that I enjoyed, one that I would recommend, and one that I hope to see developed in future games. I know that the designer is really working on Red Winter 2, and well, trust me, I'm looking forward to that game because I really enjoyed the system and I want to be able to play uh, this system more in future games.